Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I am Bennett uh, Thomas, and I am a final year PhD candidate at Monash University. Um, tonight, I will be giving you a talk on the title, Extraction and Separation of Rare Earth Elements from Victorian Brown Coal Fly Ash. It's quite a mouthful. And uh, I have the pleasure of sharing this research with my two wonderful supervisors, Professors Shankar Bhattacharya and Ramit Singh. So um, I'm going to sort of segue from where we ended. Yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. We love, uh, I mean, it inspires me to see how we are pushing the frontiers of science and engineering to get new fuel source. But this iconic image right there, uh, I know many of you can relate to it. Uh, there was a message that was given out back in 2017 that coal is still needed. But here I am trying to play devil's advocate here and say there are two problems with using coal. One, it's not green. We need greener sources of fuel. And two, there is a waste problem. And tonight I'm going to draw your attention towards that. Now, here's the deal. 70% of electricity for Australian households come from burning coal. Now that means we generate nearly 11.4 million tons of coal ash every single year. That is a problem. So you might be wondering what sort of, what is coal combustion byproducts? A simple example is when you burn wood, you get wood ash. When you burn coal, you get coal ash. However, in a power station, what happens is coal, based on its density and weight, some of it flies away. And what we collect, about 80 to 90% is known as coal fly ash, right? And that's the major constituent of coal ash right now we are focusing on. So what's the theme of my talk is to clean up our act. We have a duty of care to do this, not just for ourselves and our future generations, but for what we have messed up so far. The problem, we have no commercial application so far for brown coal fly ash, either in civil or construction projects. Two, it is disposed of in ash ponds, raising severe environmental concerns. So we started talking about this. We, we started analyzing the problem. We are like, why isn't this being used? Why isn't there an application for coal fly ash? Here's the deal. You could possibly substitute cement in for concrete and use fly ash, but that's bad for business. People don't want to do it. So what else could we do with it? That's where we came in with a different dimension of thought and we said, what if we could extract valuable metals from coal fly ash? And here we are in the second decade, enter rare earth elements into the chat. So what are rare earth elements? They're a group of 15 lanthanides, as you can see in the modern periodic date table, and including scandium and yttrium. These, do not let the name fool you, these metals are not so rare and are in fact present all around us. But here's the deal. They are difficult to mine from ground up because there are very limited mining locations that can actually, we can actually do a feasible and a commercially important process for mining rare earths. So the question is, what's the big deal, Ben? Why are we talking about rare earths? Here's the thing. If you walked in tonight with a smartphone watching us online from your computer screens or televisions, you're using something that uses rare earth elements. We need it. Have you ever seen a big line outside Chatty when a new iPhone drops? Yeah, we need all these gadgets and we are a consumer market. Now, Australia being blessed with some really good resources, here's another problem. We are good at mining, but we do not refine it. We do not process it. Neither do we make anything out of the metals we mine. We send it out to countries where environmental rules are a bit more lax. So, we took on this head on. We asked a few important questions, which is, can we utilize a feedstock which has been already been mined, washed and processed, and as a secondary source of rare earth elements? Can, is it possible to do it from brown coal fly ash? And if so, how do they exist? And finally, can we do it sustainably so that we can build opportunities in Australia and create more uh, manufacturing industries right here, right now? So what did we do? We collected samples from three power stations in the Gippsland Basin, Yalon, Morwell, and Loyang. One of that is shut down, and two of both of them have imminent closure dates. So uh, we fell on some prior art, and we saw that Bone and Schaap in 1981 observed trace elements of 
rare earth elements in Victorian brown coal. Now, this is way before I walked on the face of earth. Uh, now, 40 years later, it was for the first time, we understood that there were all 17 rare earths present in Victorian brown coal fly ash. Now, what that means is we just weren't looking right. We had to just look at a waste or something that has been discarded to see that it was nearly enriched 200 times in brown coal fly ash. How fascinating, right? So the question then was, uh, is it really important? Is it viable? Is it, can we commercialize this? What is the impact of this research that we are doing? So and um, another important finding that we did is Loyang Power Station which is still in operation, had one of the highest concentrations of rare earth elements, around 400 parts per million. Now that is important finding for us because it is still in operation, still generating fly ash, and we can still use it. So we dived in deeper. We wanted to understand. Now these beautiful images were collected from a scanning electron microscope, but after hours and hours of scan, I can promise you tonight that we found nothing. Uh, but we did build the first piece of the puzzle, in our recurring scans, we saw that aluminum, silicon, titanium, and iron kept coming up in our energy scans. So the question was, where are these rare earths? I mean, we see everything. We see the bulk metals. We're seeing what we're, we're not seeing what we're looking for, but we're seeing everything else. Um, we started asking questions. Are they present in some sort of rare earth bearing mineral forms? And from an X-ray diffraction study, we realized that most of the mineral content in Loyang, which had the highest rare earth concentration, was mainly quads. Now here's the deal, quads cannot hold rare earths. So there goes again our hypothesis, and we had to come up with the next hypothesis that, okay, they're not present as crystals, so maybe amorphous structures, right? So what we did is we went along with a counterintuitive approach. We did sequential extraction using six different solvents. We mixed it with water, mildly acidic. It is classical hydrometallurgical techniques that we uh, employed. However, here's the deal. We found that nearly 60% of it were in fact present in amorphous structures. So from an engineering mind and engineering perspective, here's what we find, here's what we concluded. If we were to actually target these aluminosilicate structures, which is hard to dissolve, we could effectively get more than 80% of rare earth elements from coal fly ash. But we were not satisfied. We were like, we just need to figure out how they look like in fly ash, or is it really there? I need to see a visual evidence. That's when we went and knocked doors with our friendly Australian synchrotron neighbors. And what you're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time after a couple of years, we saw rare earth elements. Now these tiny specks in a beautiful black canvas, those are rare earth elements, literal definition of needles in a haystack, right? And what we wanted to conclude was how did they exist? What did they look like? Um, so it's a couple of scans and numerous scans, in fact, we see that they were present as oxides and some of the elements coexisted as well. So here's another question. Was it actually an amorphous aluminosilicate structures? So here's something we found as well, that after the samples were partially processed, there was no oxides, and in fact, they were present in glassy structures. And there comes in my final bit of the research to show you that we were able to extract nearly 55% using just organic acids. Now, that's not good enough. When you keep it against an inorganic or toxic chemical, that's just not great. So what did we do? We used ultrasound, high energy pulses of ultrasound to break into these hard structures. And ladies and gentlemen, we did achieve 99% extraction efficiency. That is even better than some of the inorganic acid processes that's out there. So is it scalable? We tested, we started with 100 liters, we scaled it up to 30 liters and the results are reproducible. And the final bit of the research that we did was to separate them out and here you go, some beautiful looking crystals and rare earths finally separated using electrodialectic separation techniques. And today, as I speak, we have about 40 to 60% rare earth separations achieved in our lab, and we're targeting to push that to 90%. Uh, yeah, so what's the impact and significance? This research is not just for coal fly ash. We can translate this to mine tailings, recycling electronic waste, 
we are at a future we need to recycle and preserve and conserve the resources we have because these resources are finite. And on that note, uh, I'm just going to conclude and say uh, a shout out to these following people without whom we couldn't have done this research. And yeah, the floor is now open for questions. Thank you.